soft, that it's lovely to touch, um, yet durable. Lovely to touch. <laughs> <laughs> When we think of sustainable businesses, we think of companies like Tesla or Patagonia. Today I want to share a story with two entrepreneurs who started a company founded on principles of sustainability. So we're going to hear from Maureen and Lucas about their journey and why they started a swimwear company, their choices and challenges in being sustainable, and what they've learned along the way. Welcome back to Investing in Darren. Click subscribe to stay updated to more videos like this. So Maureen and Lucas, tell us about yourself. So we are really into water sports. We're very active. We love the outdoors for us. Honestly, we would say we're happiest in the water, which is one of the reasons we moved to Singapore about four years ago now. Um, yeah, we love spending time outside, winter or summer, to be honest, but mainly water sports. Um, Diving, which is something that has become our, our big passion. We became hooked on diving pretty much when we moved to Singapore. Every trip turned into a dive trip. Um, so I would say that is probably what, what defines us. And, uh, and yeah, so we, we started a, a business relatively recently. Um, well, we started work on the business a long time ago, but we started a business relatively recently. Um, was selling sustainable swimwear, particularly for women and particularly water sports swimwear, which is why the the relationships with water sports came in. Yeah. Many people inspire to start a business. What made you decide to start this business now? I think that's all you. Yeah, so um, <laughs> we, we've always wanted to start a business. This is not something that was just an idea that popped up. We've been thinking about starting a business for about 11 years and we started a lot of different things. We had lots of different ideas on shaving kits or braids and jewelry and uh, lots of different things and they never made it to the market because we either got distracted or, or, or just never even got off the ground we had an, an epiphany and they just stopped yeah, we yeah. couldn't be bothered anymore we lost motivation or something it just didn't add up and so with with parrotfish it really started because i i was doing a lot of uh, work with some non-profits and um, i was looking for rash guards to do that i was doing some Working as a, and for as those a that don't diver. know what a rash guard is, it's a long sleeve piece of swimwear. <laughs> yes, uh, like a lycra, full long sleeve. A rashy or a rash vest, something Rash before. vest, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't find a rash guard that was pretty, that wasn't, you know, that, that looked a little bit more feminine, that was also made from sustainable materials. And that honestly really annoyed me. And um, for guys, it's okay. We have, we have things like Scuba Pro and mm. Quicksilver. It's, it's black, it's grey, it's blue, it looks all right. We don't care if it has, if it looks any good. Um, and, and for women, there's not an awful lot out there. Yeah, there's, so. a, there's a couple of companies, but they didn't really have the designs that I was looking for. I felt like I couldn't dress myself in an individual way whilst doing water sports um, yeah, as, a, as a woman. The function was available in the market. The form, not there, especially for women. Exactly. And so there was an untapped opportunity. Starting with your own self, you wanted it yourself. Yeah, exactly. So I, and, and that is how we came up with the designs. We were thinking, what are what are the types of designs that I would want to wear, that I would want to buy myself, that I feel like I'm missing currently in the market. Um, and yeah, that's what really inspired us. And I think the reason, because we're, we're both so passionate about water sports and we do it on a weekly basis, um, that's why we stuck to it. Well, and because it started, it, it, uh, like you said, it started with a, with a, a genuine need I mean in this case for Maureen but it we, you know things in the past sounded like a good idea but really it, it wasn't it wasn't a hole in our in our uh, uh, life that needed filling here was something which hey I would like to see if we can produce something like this and one thing just led to another and then before you know it you have something that's a little bit more uh, uh, full-fledged as Bob Ross says happy accidents do happen in life yeah, exactly <laughs> What made sustainability important for both of you? We, we've just been very conscious of the environment. I think everybody in our generation is, pretty much. And so 
you know, plastic waste and, and, and just general carbon footprint and these kinds of things is something that we're always conscious of, we're always worried about. I think everybody in our generation needs to be a little bit worried about it if they're not. And at the same time, we wanted to start this business. And as we were exploring this, we started realizing that actually the two are relatively incompatible. You can't create a business um, and, be, and not be concerned about you know, sustainability with the business and also simultaneously be worried about the environment. Because a business, if you don't care about how you're running it, is going to have an enormous footprint. We started realizing, well, if we manufacture it out of this, that's using that's using new plastic and it's causing microfibers. And if we ship it like this, it's going to have, uh, you know, enormous carbon footprint. And all the packaging is going to involve so much plastic. And slowly we realized if we want to do it, um, whilst not being hypocrites, we have to do it in a way that is sustainable. Yeah. I do also think that the... The diving that we started around four years ago, it definitely made us realize because we, we were diving in the most beautiful locations and places, you know, especially in Southeast Asia. But then you go to the beaches and it's, it's just full of plastic and, and you go diving and you find cans and, and fishing nets and all sorts of things, you know, on your dive. And so we started doing a lot of cleanup dives and we also started doing a lot of beach cleans in Singapore itself. Um, whenever we were on vacation, we would do small beach cleans here and there. And we just realized how big this, this problem really was. And I think... We didn't want to add to it. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we really told ourselves that if we're starting this business, then we absolutely do not want to add to the problem because we wouldn't feel good about starting it. I want to add to this story. So when we got to know Maureen, like for me, myself, we knew that Maureen was really into sustainability. But I started having sympathy for it first. That means like, yeah, I know, don't use plastic straws, don't use single-use plastics. It was more of a concept for me rather than a reality for me. Then Maureen invited us for beach cleanups a couple of months ago in Singapore. Our first one was in the Pasir Ris Beach in the northeast of Singapore. And I think we were there at like 1, 2 p.m. We picked up bags, tongs, clean up garbage. After an hour, we thought most of the beach is done. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and the tide receded. And there was just way more plastic. Like you felt like you were just cleaning up 0.1% of all the plastic you could see. And I think that was when my, my sympathy turned into empathy for this. It's yeah, you, it's uh, depressing, isn't it? The first time you do a beach clean. Yes. Especially somewhere somewhere here in Asia, I think, you know, you go to a beach and see, we're on Sentosa now and we're looking at the beach here and it's obviously cleaned. They have, they employ people to clean the beaches here and make sure it doesn't look... But you go to any beach that doesn't have an army of people cleaning it. And I mean, in a, in a square meter, I remember when we did the last beach clean, what did we pick up? Like in a single square meter, 50 straws it's like like it sounds like i'm exaggerating but i'm not it's, it's just ridiculous and especially the the copy bags i think yeah. those were especially bad um yeah. it makes you just reconsider things you know when whenever especially in asia a lot of people they would ask you do you want to carry a bag do you need a carrier and you know if you just reconsider for a moment and say actually i don't i don't need a carrier bag or now when we go to starbucks we bring our own cups so we don't use any of the and it's it's small things it's small habits that probably don't make a difference in your life, but they, they can make a difference. Drinking um, beer without a straw. <laughs> the only way to drink beer. <laughs> How do you bring these values into your business? Like what were the conscious decisions you made when you agreed, okay, we're going to start this business? So we will start by saying the, the three core values of our business are to do good, to empower women, and to be human and i think that is something it just it came it was very natural for us to came up to come up with these values but i think yeah i i mean to answer the question more directly it's um at every step you have to make a decision you know we're faced with a particular challenge we have a couple of options to solve it do we go with the cheap option or or uh, you know maybe this one's a little bit more sustainable and we do it that way uh, do we go with the option that's more effective and faster, or do we go with the one that is perhaps uh, a little bit more, more human? And um, just making sure that when we make a decision, ask ourselves, okay, we have these three values. Is the decision we're about to make, is it going to contradict one of these values or not? And if the answer is yes, then we, we go for a different option. Um, and uh, at every step of the way, um, it's, it's about asking yourself that question. And 
and then it becomes relatively easy. And before you know it, what you've built uh, just adheres to these values. Starting a business already comes with a lot of difficult choices, decisions, and sacrifices. Adding the element of designing for sustainability or living that value builds on that. It is like you're a level one corrector playing in a level 10 level. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about some of the choices and also the challenges you have to face when you bring sustainability to your business. Immediately, anyone that starts a company will say, when you start a business, focus first on just getting customers, getting profits. Everything else is secondary. Sustainability is like a nice to have. Yeah. So how do you approach this as you crafted your business model? Every single time we have to make a decision, we're finding it's harder to go down the route that is is more ethical and more sustainable. And it's, it's not even just, you know, we've talked a lot about the environment. It's also just ethically in terms of the kinds of manufacturers we work with and stuff like that. So it's sustainable beyond just the environment. But it's so easy to do it, or it's a lot easier to do it if you're not worried about sustainability. Um, the most concrete example in my mind is when we ship internationally, we have to attach a an airway bill to our, our packages. It's a, an invoice that sits on the outside of packages for customs. Traditionally or conventionally, those are attached to the package with a plastic wallet. Anybody who's opened a package will know. They are always plastic, always plastic. Because we, they have to be see-through. Because they have to be see-through, that's right, because customs has to see it. Um, finding somebody who manufactures wallets like this out of something that is biodegradable was the biggest nightmare. It took us months to it find. It took us months to find. And we finally found one uh, abroad. And we were able to get some stuff over here out of a paper, a wax paper that is still waterproof, but sort of translucent so you can see the documentation. It would have been so much easier to just say, okay, fine, this this little bit will be plastic and yeah. everything else won't be. And also a lot a lot cheaper, right? It would have been easier, but cheaper. also a lot cheaper if we had just gotten, you know, a thousand pieces or something from a... Uh, a manufacturer yeah. um, somewhere in the region and obviously paying for something that is sustainable that is biodegradable as well again it, it comes at a premium cost it, it is what it unfortunately I wish it wasn't I wish this we were at a stage now where it would it would be the norm yeah and you know purchasing plastic envelopes would be more expensive than purchasing paper envelopes mm. but we're not there yet unfortunately See, even companies that are not stable like Tesla, when I order from Tesla store, the air wheel deal is in plastic. Mm. And in business, it's about choices. Mm. So the difference going from 80% sustainable to 100% sustainable is insane. People don't appreciate that. It's not a 20% difference. Yeah. The last 20% is probably 80% of your incremental costs. Yeah. So at, at what point do you decide we're going to be 100% sustainable versus we need to make a call like it's sustainable enough it's helping enough people, getting the message out. How do you wrestle with that decision? I don't think we've, fat, we, we've gotten to a place where we've had to compromise just yet. Um, we've forced ourselves to stick to the sustainable option so far, and it has been inconvenient, yes. But so far, it hasn't been a deal breaker where we've had to say, okay, we'll draw a line in the sand and say, okay, here we'll go for the, the cheaper option, or here we'll go for... Um, we've sacrificed scalability for it, and we've sacrificed you know, things like that. Um, we've sacrificed margins and stuff like that. Mm. And, you know, maybe one day if, if this grows and it becomes a bit of a bigger deal and, and perhaps we have investors on board and things like that, maybe there's a bit more pressure to make those, cut those corners and say that, okay, in this instance, 80% is enough. Mm. We haven't, I don't think we have, we have that anymore. No, but I would also say that's exactly why we haven't invited investors on board at this stage because we... We want to have full control over this. We don't want to um, kind of bend the pressure of somebody else saying, you know, you need, you need X amount of sales within the first half year. That's not what we're about. We're, we're definitely a slow fashion brand. We're not a fast fashion brand. We're, not gonna, we're never going to be the, the type of company that is going to bring out a new collection every month or every three months mm. just in order to stay stay relevant and stay up with the with the newest trends that's we we produce high quality um swimwear that is durable and that's going to last a, a long time i would probably say the biggest cost other than obviously the price itself of kind of sustainable packaging etc has been time mm. has been really to 
fucked up. There were times when we couldn't move forward to the next step before we had sourced a certain packaging material. Or, for example, just finding the material that the rash guards are made out of, plastic bottles. It's a material called reprieve. And just finding that material and starting the sampling process and making sure that it's right, that it's soft, that it's lovely to touch, um, yet durable. Lovely to touch. <laughs> <laughs> like it took us months to find the the right material that we wanted to make the rash guards out it took us months to find certain packaging types it took us months to find the right manufacturer that would manufacture you know small batches because we didn't produce of course uh, uh, as much as you know other companies like super pro or roxy or billabong etc would produce um so those are all factors to consider what you mentioned earlier on we're not a fast fashion company, we are slow fashion. And actually, more and more consumers are trying to go back to slow fashion, like it's almost in trend, from obvious examples like Patagonia, or even buying products from like Peak Design, we're just talking about it, mm. lifetime guarantees. Or actually, even Osprey, in... Osprey, and uh, Nalgene, yeah. mm. all lifetime guarantees. Yeah. And even in luxury brands like Hermes, Hermes is not fast fashion, they're timeless fashions. and the product's supposed to last a long time, or even certain watches as well. So do you see this as actually a good timing to think about a slow fashion brand and business? Yeah, I think it's long overdue. Good. It's yeah. long overdue. Again, it comes up, it comes, it, it, it's unfortunate cases that it comes with trade-offs. Fast fashion is cheap fashion, right? H&M, Uniqlo. You buy the stuff that's incredibly cheap, but it won't last, and you'll have to give it away, throw it away. 90%, 90% of, of stuff you give to charity, clothing, ends up in landfill. Yeah, but I think the, the even more shocking statistic is 10% of garments, clothes that get produced, go directly to landfill. Oh, they, without they even never, being sold. Like they Unico never get sold, they never go to the store or anything, they just go directly to landfill because there's something wrong with the product, because they they're not perfect um, because they're overproduced, you don't need it. Like 10%. That's crazy. That is just. But yeah, so it uh, is it a good time? It's an overdue time for the planet. It's not a good time from a business standpoint, though. The money's in, in fast, quick yeah. turnaround times, masses and volumes of sales. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, we, we, it's not again. It's not sustainable. We we talk about we say the word sustainable a lot, but really what it means is it's not going to continue. At some point, something's going to break, yes. and uh, and unfortunately, in this case, it's going to be the planet or, or you know the oceans or something that we really care about. Even on this topic, when we make the choices of sustainability, there's a lot of a perception gap. So, example, if you go to the supermarket, you see something labeled organic or it's better or or something like hundred percent green and sustainable. But actually, how do you communicate what sustainability actually is? Like the reality versus the hype of it. That's a very yeah. good question. And I mean, there, there's, I mean, this is there's a lot of media coverage on on greenwashing at the moment in lots of different industries. And honestly, it would be very easy for us to just say we're sustainable. Yeah. We could we could produce them the rash guards out of reprieve made from plastic bottles, we could stop there. We could say, we're a sustainable company. But that wouldn't be, that wouldn't actually be a sustainable company. Yeah. Um, so there's there's all of these other factors that that need to be considered, that need to, need to go into it. I don't think we do anything to educate people about what is and what isn't genuinely green. I think people are starting to recognize what is and isn't. Yes. I no longer pay as much attention on labels when, when it says it's ethically sourced or it's organic or it's free range eggs mm. doesn't mean anything anymore we just have to rely on people being educated themselves about what works and what, what is actually green and isn't green and what is greenwashing and you mentioned the brands yourself that are doing it really well Patagonia is if we had to if we had a you know talk about a company that we model ourselves after with Patagonia. Which is funny because the material that we use, Reprieve, mm -hmm. is actually the same material that Patagonia uses as well. So, uh, and that was that was definitely one of the 
um, the factors that went into us choosing that material because it is very durable. It's worth mentioning as well, actually, I've just had a thought. Mm -hmm. Our footprint is obviously never going to be zero. Yeah. By, just by the very fact that we are doing business and we are shipping stuff and we are we, we have a footprint and it, it is bigger than it would be if we did nothing at all. Yes. Um, we can minimize it as much as we can. But what Patagonia does so well is they give back. And, and one, of, you know, one of the values that we've tried to imbue into Parrotfish is doing good. And so what we do is we, we give to 1% for the planet. So we pledge about 1% of our revenue, so pre-cost revenue, to 1% of the planet. Again, it's not something we're terribly loud about. We mention it on the website and stuff, but that's 1% of revenue that we're just, that we're just giving away. Mm -hmm. And that would be a cost that we could easily do without. But we, we, we want to go beyond just minimizing what our footprint is and trying to offset it a little bit further. And actually, the founder of 1% for the Planet, he says it's not philanthropy. It's it's just the cost of doing business, yeah. right? Like, this is something you should rent. consider. Paying rent to the planet. Exactly. Is what it it's paying rent to the planet, paying rent to the resources that we're using. On this topic, I want to talk about how you try to market your product, your business, from a sustainability standpoint. Example, when many people ask Elon Musk why EVs didn't take off for a long time, it's because people weren't interested in cars only for it's better for the planet message. So Elon Musk set out to make the fastest, best, safest cars. Mm -hmm. The nice side effect is that it's a bit more sustainable. But they don't talk about it front and center to mm -hmm. everyone. And so when we position sustainability, some people feel it creates a niche, some people feel it expands the market. How do you approach positioning your business on sustainability? I, I think... Originally, the intention was to position it entirely around green and capture, as you said, the market that is that really cares about the environment. And we thought that was the that was the primary selling point. And and obviously, we're we're going to adapt to what what works online, what works on social media. And, and you know, as as we do more and more of that, we're learning that you know, yeah, the green part is nice, but it's a perk. Yes, that on its own is not going to sell a product. It mm -hmm. is it, it is the fact that. You know, it looks good, or that it's comfortable, or that you know it does. In our case, it, it protects you from the sun, um, and so those are the selling points. The fact that it's green is is an additional point, and, and so if that gets us to sell more, then of course we'll you know we'll we'll accept that, and that is the message we want to consume or, or share with consumers. Um, but but that won't detract from the fact that we want it to be sustainable. So. Mm. Although it may not be necessarily front and center, if that's what gets us out there and that's what gets us in the hands of, of people and get, you know, allows us to set an example for other companies that are, are seeing the success of a, a brand that is um, green and sustainable, then so be it. Yeah. You know? I don't think a lot of people buy from us because we're, just because we're a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. um, I think they buy from us because they like what our rash guards look like, they like the designs, they are into water sports. Um, they want to look good whilst they do the water sports, and then it's an it's an added benefit. However, what we have heard from almost every single one from the people who bought from us is that they are so positively surprised by what the rash guards feel like, how soft they are, how durable, how you know they're just very different, very unique. They stand out, um, and we've even had so we now work with a few brand ambassadors in all over the world, from Singapore to Hawaii. Um, and some of them said that they, they weren't very aware of sustainability, especially people here in, in Singapore and in Asia who we work with. They weren't very aware of the problem as much. And you that, said yourself, yeah. right? you, you were empathetic, you were sympathetic, but not empathetic. Yeah. Yes. Until you started seeing it yourself. And, um, so we do share a little bit so on social we, media and Instagram yeah. and stuff about the, the kind of problems we face and we proactively share posts from Team C's and yeah. all of these other organizations that are trying to do something and highlight how big of a problem it is yeah. and why it's important to do that. Yeah. So. Now let's talk about some of the learnings you got in this journey so far. What we say was the most unexpected lesson? I would say how long it takes to start a company. I think in the beginning when we started, we thought, We'll launch within a month. 
and we we couldn't have been more wrong. We're never going to get investors now. We've spoken about three times about how long it takes us to do anything. Yeah. They're just going to think these must be the laziest people on the planet. Yeah, it takes us long. Um, no, but I think I think it, it takes a long time to start in. E I think e-commerce specifically because there's so much logistics you know packaging you need an actual product you need a warehouse you need to store it somewhere like there's so many things involved it's a lot more time intense um than starting a, an online service for example um so i think that was that was my main learning for me i mean that's that was that was a surprising challenge i think for me the flip side is how it's easier than than you'd think i mean it it's it's <laughs> As in, it's just a series of challenges. Each each individual challenge is, is difficult, and but it's it's one problem after another, and each problem has a solution. We just have to figure it out, and you just take it as it comes. We had the luxury of not being under any time pressure. We had a lot more time because of COVID, and so we were under <laughs> lockdown and stuff. But it is one challenge after another. So, you know, well, we need to find a manufacturer. Okay, well, we spend a, a little bit of time trying to figure out what, how we do that. Then we need to figure out how do we... How do we set up the logistics? So we break that down into a couple of more problems and we solve each one. And it, actually, I think this is Will Smith's quote, but he says, uh, if you want to build a brick wall, you don't say, I'm going to build a brick wall. You start by laying one brick as, as perfectly as you can lay. And you just keep doing that. And before you know it, you've got a brick wall. The same is true with this. Before you know it, you're a business and yeah. you wake up one day and you're like, oh my God, look at this. It's actually, it's actually something. So, yeah. And I, I think there's another thing that I don't remember who said that, but starting starting a business is like a, a mini MBA. So I almost feel like mm. I know how businesses work so much better now, even though I've, I've been working obviously for, for corporations and big corporations for a long time, than I, I would have, you know, a year, a year and a half ago, just interacting with manufacturers and marketing a product, import, export. Cheapest MBA in the world. Cheapest yeah. MBA in the world is what it's called, yeah. Although... That depends on how much you the spend. Type of we won't go there. We won't go there. <laughs> um, yeah, but that has been a, a major learning for me. One of the other things that people think about on sustainability is that it's a first world problem. It's something that the rich can worry about. It's a luxury that I do not have for products like swimwear. What's your take? That's a really, that's a challenging one. You're stra you're straying into sort of difficult territories. We've, we said earlier, right, being, being sustainable costs, costs a business more, it costs us more, it costs a, a consumer more. If you want to be green, um, it's going to cost you more. If you want to go to the supermarket that only sells organic stuff, that doesn't put anything into plastic bags, it's all going to cost more. If you go to the supermarkets here, if you, if you want to use paper bags and plastic bags, again, you'll get a surcharge for that. So I can, I can see where that perception comes from. Honestly, I, th I think it's a justified perception. I, I would go further and say that it is a problem caused by the wealthy. Uh, you know, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but most of the world's uh, uh, greenhouse emissions, I think, can be tracked to the consumption of first world countries. Or, right? where, or where those products are being produced for those first world countries. Right, right? but it's, it's, yeah. it's our insatiable appetite for... The latest jeans, or or you know the, the the latest iPhone or Apple Watch, that leads the world to, to manufacture at the rate that we do and, and produce at the rate we do it, and not care and cut costs where we do. So yeah. uh, that, it's that, it's a problem. It's a problem that only the wealthy can, I suppose, afford to deal with. It's also one that is caused in in great part because of them. Yeah. It's not great. Obviously, it's a problem we all need to care about, but. I mean, that, that's the thing, like families who, who are struggling to put food on the table, right? They're, they're, they're not the, the problem, they're not causing this problem, right? Yeah. Because they're not the ones consuming, um, you know, jeans at no end or, mm. or uh, want the newest iPhone, as you were mentioning. Um, but I think what we, what we found traveling through Southeast Asia is that there's... There's definitely a lack of awareness, mm. uh, especially in, in poorer communities where families would let their children play with, with plastic waste on the beach, where small islands, you know, they, it doesn't seem to bother them or they don't, it seems to be part of life for them that the beach is just full of plastic. Yes. Um, and it always surprised us that nobody 
sees that as an issue and kind of brings people together and says, okay, let's clean up our own beach because we're living in this beautiful paradise island. And um, yeah. I wonder if that is not necessarily a bad thing even to start with, that let's say sustainability is something, sustainability is something for those who are rich. I'll give you an example, like when we talked about Tesla earlier, when Elon Musk started Tesla, he knew that EVs were really expensive, so he started with a roadster. He got the rich people to buy the fancy sports cars so that he could afford to invest in factories and R&Ds to develop the cheaper EVs, so that now more people can use it. And if you start with the rich, they fund, you need scale, every business needs scale. Your cost of production goes down to scale. Your cost of R&D, design, everything spreads out to scale. And maybe that's not a, not necessarily a bad thing if that's the current environment to start yeah. with the rich and then eventually because today it feels like if I want to guide something sustainable or even if I want to eat healthy oh my god even I, I, I need to pay yeah. more so it's more like a but versus an and conversation like it is a trade-off versus why can't we get both well what's the what's the meat substitute the impossible. impossible impossible that's three four times more expensive than a normal bag and, and so even the sodium content is actually higher oh yeah, I didn't know that yeah. but so but but yeah so it's I think the, the answer that everybody wants to hear here is, no, it's a problem for everybody and it's a problem for all of us and we're all in this together. But the truth is, it's not. It, it, it would be great if it was, but it, it costs money to try and fix this problem and it's going to cost businesses money and it's going to cost consumers money and the people who have that money need to be the ones to do something about it. Agree. What is one lesson you would share with other entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting a business, they want to ground it on sustainable values as well. But they feel it's very difficult. Yeah. And you just given a very good behind the scenes look of a lot of the challenges we will face. Come and talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> remind yourself why you're doing it. We have to remind ourselves why we're doing it. I'm tempted, I think, more often than Maureen is to to cut that corner and say, ah, you know, let's just this part's fine. Let let's just no one's gonna know if we use plastic at this it's fine. And Maureen will, will have to bring me back and, and ground me again and say, no, look, we started this. We wanted to do it right. So just remind yourself why you're doing it because the consumer won't remind you. In fact, every pressure is to cut that corner. And, and it'll be very easy to try and cut it. And just remind yourself that you're doing it, even if it takes a sticky note on your mirror. Yeah. But I think it, it really it comes down to, to research. And I think this is where Lucas is, is incredibly good. Like, I'm the one who has the idea like we yeah. need we need paper enclosed envelopes you know for the way bill um that are made out of a sustainable material like i cannot accept plastic and then lucas is the one who finds it so i think have somebody in your team who is good and excited about doing research and finding finding these one percent you know manufacturers and suppliers that are doing it differently starting a business is hard it is relentless at times. There is no off button at times. It is an MBA, whether you want it to happen or not. The, the classes happen, they come to you, you don't have to go to them. So what would be, if you have a story to share each one of you, like what was one memorable moment or situation where you went, wow, like, this is why I did this? Okay. I think for me, it was probably when so one of our brand ambassadors she is based in singapore and she sent me a very long message um, and she said look maureen i am um, i was never really into sustainability i never thought about it much before you approached me you know to become a brand ambassador for parrotfish and ever since i've been following you and i've been using your rash guards and mainly she uses them for her um, for her wakeboarding, uh, so uses them because they're a functional product. But ever since I've been following you, now I pay attention to it so much more. And, you know, I think about a straw, I think about the plastic cup, and just changing that mindset, even if it's just one person, that, that really, really inspires me. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, maybe, maybe we are actually getting through to some people and maybe they understand the why behind why we started this company. So for me, that that was probably a, a big moment, yeah. 
I'm sitting here racking my brain trying to think of a, of a moment. Um, <laughs> Maybe it was when we, when we did our first order. Wasn't our first order like my mother or something? No, I mean, it was a friend, yes. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Definitely somebody we knew. No, yeah, I mean, the moment we, we got our first order from someone we didn't know, we got, you know, when we launched, we got a couple of orders That's from true. friends and family. Yeah. And then one day we woke up, we checked my phone, we checked the Shopify the first, app. It was the first day. <clears throat> and we, we, got, we got an order, <clears throat> and we both tried to figure out who is this person? Do we know this person? Yeah. Do, do we know this person? Is this, is this one of your friends? Is this one of my friends? And we realized we're not related to that person at all. We're like, oh my God, this is amazing. In terms of why we do it, I think just every time we, we, we get reminded by a brand like, like Patagonia and, and North Face, and these, are, these are brands that are leading the way, and, you know, leading the charge here, and they're doing it really well. And whenever I see a post, you know, anything about them in the news, and I, I would get reminded about how much respect I have for a brand like that. And I, I like to think that we're, we're trying to follow in their footsteps, we're, we're part of a, a group of organizations that wants to do things a little bit better, and that's that's really rewarding. So, thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Maureen, for giving us a behind the scenes look of being entrepreneurs, sharing your own personal journeys on sustainability, the challenges, everything that we've learned. It is a journey, and it is very scary actually putting this out here on on YouTube. For sometimes it feels like the world is judging us. <laughs> yeah, and. One day, hopefully, years from now, we'll look back at this video and say, yeah, this was in the early days when we doubted ourselves or when we started and a look at all these noobs and how much we've learned along the way. Yeah. And how young they look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. for having us. Thank it's been so a much. great fun. Yeah. Welcome. It's been really great. If you found this video useful, please click the like button. Hit subscribe to stay updated with more interviews like this. Take care and hope to see you in the beach. I'll put a link down in the description below the Parrotfish website where you can check out their items. If you like it, share with your friends. Bye-bye everyone. Bye.